Primitivist underscore on Instagram asks, hello, as a libertarian, how do you feel about the EPA and how should we save and help repair the environment? Is cap and trade a solid strategy? Also, have you ever read Walden by Henry David Thoreau? And if so, how did you feel about it? Thanks. So how do I feel about the EPA? That's the Environmental Protection Agency, the part of the federal government allegedly tasked with protecting the environment. Of course, it's like the United States military being called the Department of Defense, um, Department of Homeland Security being based on more insecurity and fear than providing any kind of real security. Uh, it, it, it's one of these kind of opposite names of government, the Internal Revenue Service. We're going to steal from you and call it a service. Yeah, right. So the Environmental Protection Agency, let's just be clear from the beginning, is not intended to protect the environment. It is intended to make government look like it cares about protecting the environment. It has appeared to make it look like they are putting corporations in check. But in reality, what the EPA does is just further the policy of government's corporate sponsors. So if, if you believe that mythology that the EPA can provide a legitimate service, then you're really falling for a dangerous myth, which is first and foremost premised on the idea that government coercion is an effective way of solving problems, that violence is a good way to solve problems, that uh, you know if, if a company violates somebody's property, then, you know, they're, they're going to be able to, to pay that off uh, rather than, you know, actually be held accountable for it properly in the first place. So the EPA makes it more difficult, not less, for corporations to be held accountable for pollution. So how should we save and help repair the environment? This is part of libertarianism that is often left out of the conversation in a very dangerous way that I think would make it a lot easier for a lot of liberals, especially and environmentalists in general, people who are concerned with environmental protection, to, to, to get over the idea of Randian libertarianism, that it's, you know, dog eat dog in, in, in the economy and destroy the environment and get whatever you want out of it, that it's, you know, it's, it's uh, that idea is that if you have the right to own yourself and therefore you have the right to own the product of your labor and therefore you have the right to own property by mixing your labor with natural resources, this is the Lockean concept of property rights going back to John Locke, that you can then own a piece of nature, right? Which means that as a human being living on planet Earth, you must therefore have some concept of equitable access to natural resources for all human beings. That you can't tell me that you have a right to put up a fence around a thousand acres and claim it as yours, but you know, I, I can't put up a fence around 10 acres and say, I'm going to live off the land here. This is my share of the surface of the earth as a human being. Now, of course, it's not perfect and it's going to be subjective and it's going to be determined by the market. And it's going to be determined by the general area in which those natural resources are. And there's going to be a natural balance of supply and demand when it comes to that. And when you get to a, a, a system where people really truly own natural resources, they have a, a vested interest in preserving them. So it is kind of... Uh, you know, one of those things that for a lot of environmentalists who want to, to use force to protect the environment because it belongs to them, yeah, you want to defend your property. It, it's, it's hard to sort of tease out how uh, government is, is contrary to that end goal. But if you deconstruct the premises of the government mythology of, of government uh, protecting the environment, you see that, yes, you're using violence to solve problems that are better solved through peaceful means. And you see that the government, especially the United States military, is the biggest polluter on the planet. So, of course, yeah, of course, it's not holding itself accountable because you, when you have removed a broad-based market mechanism of holding people accountable for their pollution, then you end up with whoever is controlling the new mechanism, namely the government, giving themselves uh, you know, a free pass to pollute however they want with, without any accountability for it. You are giving up your right as an independent human being to defend your share of natural resources and the voluntary means of enforcing that. And maybe enforcing isn't the right word. But the voluntary means of achieving greater harmony with the environment are, are going to be far superior to government ones. So that when a, a company is doing something 
that, that you disagree. I mean, just look at the oil and gas industry as, as a big example, right? I mean, not only do you have, uh, like you watch the documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? You have government helping you know, uh, squash and, and suppress the technologies that would render the fossil fuel industry much, much less relevant than it is today. You end up with government uh, uh, making things worse. You cannot compete. If you look at the oil and gas industries and what they're doing, you go, geez, you know what? It'd be great if we had, uh, we had a, a, an oil and gas company that did this, that, that, that you know, had different policies. And as long as it's going to extract oil and gas, it's going to invest more in safety protections. It's, you know, it's going to insure against damages. It's, it's not going to you know, allow uh, an oil leak like happened with BP in the Gulf of Mexico to ever happen again. It's not going to pollute like the refineries in Houston do where they send you know, sheets of pollution and just raining down uh, of crap of debris and, and, and waste products from the, the oil refineries on houses in the neighborhood causing it. We're, just, we're not going to do that. We are, in order to compete, we are going to have to charge you know, 10 cents more at the pump and have separate gas stations. We're, you can't do that. You literally cannot do that without losing a shit ton of money because you're competing against the existing corporate oligopoly, the cartel of the current oil and gas companies. And that's because of government protectionism, uh, because of government corporatism. So uh, you ask primitivists specifically, uh, is cap and trade a solid strategy? No, it's not. It's, it's an arbitrary central planning that, that endorses a certain amount of pollution that we could probably do a lot better better in terms of lowering if we were able to unleash these technologies that, that again, would render the oil and gas industry pretty much obsolete. And instead, when you turn to cap and trade, when you turn to government, you're re-entrenching the system. So finally, this is a great question. I appreciate this very much, Primitivist. Have you ever read Walden by Henry David Thoreau? So how did you feel about it? Yes, I read Walden when I was very young. It was very influential on me, of course. Civil disobedience being perhaps a little bit more relevant at this point. But uh, Walden was uh, Thoreau's book about living in a cabin. And it, it really did um, kind of give me a deeper sense of, you know, what it means to appreciate nature. I would say that uh, Thoreau and Edward Abbey uh, were my big influences there. And I highly recommend all of their work. Edward Abbey, you can start with the Monkey Wrench Gang, which is about... Uh, a, a group of uh, environmentalist saboteurs um, and, and anarchists. So you'd certainly enjoy that if you're listening to this podcast right now. But of course, everything by Henry David Thoreau is wonderful as well. So please check that out. And Primitus, thank you very much for the question. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.